Okay. So, hello everyone. I'm Flavio Castelli. I'm a SUSE employee. I'm part of the containers team at SUSE. Here we do fancy stuff like Docker. We care uh, about uh, Docker both inside of OpenSUSE and inside of SUSE. We, we take care of uh, the official images that we have inside of the Docker Hub for OpenSUSE, we take care of the SLE images that we have. And now we are we, we care about other projects like Portus or Zipper Docker that are going to be covered during uh, this conference as well. And now we are entering into um, a new fancy landscape uh, and we are going to take care also about orchestration. So let's start with application containers. I, I'm going to assume you know about them, at least to a certain degree. So uh, they are lightweight. So you can run a lot of them on a single machine. Uh, the containers are all these little boxes over there. The, the big green box is the main OS. So it's green, it's open OpenSUSE. Uh, given they are lightweight, you can have lots of them on the single machine. They are also composable. You are encouraged to, to put them together in order to build uh, stuff. So you can combine two of them to create an application. You can combine three of them. This is the whole microservice thing that is such a hype nowadays. But uh, if you want to, to get serious, running everything on the same host is not going to work because it's uh, really prone to, to failures. It's not going to scale. So you want to do multi-host deployments of containers. But uh, how can you go from the situation where you have everything running on the same machine to managing a large cluster of hosts where you, you spread containers over them? So there are quite some challenges. So first of all, you have to figure out where each container should be placed on which host. Can two containers stay on the same host? Maybe yes, maybe no, because of different reasons. So you have to also to monitor the, the containers, make sure that they keep running, make sure that you monitor also the host. So if a, if a host goes down, you react to this kind of failures. And of course you have to handle those failures because you cannot let your container die. There are also interesting topics that are, you probably already faced when running containers on a single machine. So like service discovery is one of those topics. But things get even more interesting when you, when you start to run containers spread over different machines. You also have to figure out how to expose the service that are running inside of your containers to external entities like uh, your customers. And of course, you have to handle secrets. It would be nice to handle those credentials, those certificates, those SSL keys and such. And of course, there is data persistence. So, you can go on your own and try to sort everything out uh, by implementing stuff from scratch. Good luck with that. Otherwise, you can uh, choose an orchestration container and, uh, and work with that. Why I recommend to use an orchestration container? Well, first of all, you will enter this new, uh, let's say, way of thinking about the deployment. You, you will stop to care about where a container is running you will leave the, this task to the orchestration container. You will stop to care about uh, containers failing. You won't receive um, a message on your pager or whatsoever, and you, you won't have to, to SSH into a machine to restart that manually or to instruct something to do that. The orchestration engine is going to, to take care of that as well. So you have just to do one thing. This thing is to declare how things should look like. This is called a desired state. Uh, all the orchestration engines, uh, they have this concept of uh, reconciliation. So you start by describing how things should look like. Like, I want to have five instances of this container running, my web application running at the same time. I want five of them. And then you, you just forget about that as a user. Behind the scene, the orchestration engine will look at uh, what is the current state, like there are zero of those containers running. It will compute the actions that are required in order to reach this desired state, and then it will execute all those actions in order to reconcile the current state and to make your desired state happen. And this is a constant loop going on and on. So if one container dies, then the current state is different from the different state from, from the desired state, and henceforth it, it will just fix itself. So very really nice. 
but which one should you pick? There is quite some choice. So there is Kubernetes, there is Docker Swarm, there is Mesos, there is Nomad, there is Lattice, there are lots of them. So um, each one of them has its advantages, disadvantages, peculiarities and such. So at SUSE we had to figure out which one we would like to focus on, which one is the, is the recommended by us. So our approach was uh, simple. So as a team, we started to look into each one of those orchestration engines. We designed, we designed a, a use case and then we used the same approach. We evaluated each orchestration engine trying to implement this uh, scenario, which is a, a common scenario. We tried then to break the orchestration engine to see how reliable it is. And of course, while doing everything, we, we tried to, to make sure that uh, we could reuse what we did in terms of open sourcing the stuff we, we discovered or the, the specific scenario. So talking about the scenario, we, we wanted to do something more than deploying a simple web application. So we focused on Portus. Portus is a, an, an open source project developed by, by us. It's a user interface and user interface and authorization service for the Docker registry. There is going to be a, a talk about Portus uh, in the next days, I think on, on Sunday or Saturday. Um, I highly recommend you to, to attend it. It's a really cool project. So it's a web application, technically speaking. Uh, which uses a database to store its data. So we have also to run MariaDB, and it's also interacting with the registry, and the registry as well has to store its data. So uh, this is not a so easy deployment because we have to keep, care, keep track of the data, so we need stateful containers, while the whole microservice thing is uh, advo advocating for stateless containers. And uh, Portus is using some crypto stuff. So we had to handle out certificates, we have to handle keys, we had to handle traditional secrets like the DB credentials. So that was not so, um, so easy and typical. So after quite some testing and experimenting, we made our decision. And our decision is to go with Kubernetes. And this is what I'm going to talk during, uh, during the remaining part of the talk. So Kubernetes, abbreviated K8S, like interna internationalization, you know. Um, so it's a project which has been created by Google. It's based on 10 years that Google had running containers in production. Uh, it's based on, uh, on a paper called uh, About Borg, which uh, is the system that was in place inside of Google. So it's based on a really solid background. Uh, it has a really good design, of course. Uh, the guys from Google know how to run stuff uh, and how to run that at scale, so we, we, we trust them. Uh, it immediately attracted a lot of uh, people, so it has a huge uh, community which is really active. It's uh, really differentiated in terms of uh, members. It's, uh, it's a project that is not controlled by Google. In fact, it was, it's now donated uh, to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is a foundation underneath the Linux Foundation umbrella. So uh, it's, um, it's uh, pretty famous, so there is a lot of interest from lots of people in using Kubernetes. And um, what is most important, it's uh, an opinionated solution, which means that uh, it has an answer to basically all the questions you might have. This can be a bad thing for some people because maybe you want to be free to choose whatever they want, but it's uh, also a really good thing uh, for most of the person, uh, I think, because uh, basically, if you have to, to solve the problem like service discovery or persistent volume with, uh, with some uh, orchestration engines, you're up to your own. You have to look at, uh, I don't know, 10 open source projects in order to figure out which one you want to trust, which one is going to work for you. And you have to make sure that it's going to keep working uh, because uh, there are different projects collaborating, kind of collaborating together. So at each release, you might risk that something is not working properly. Kubernetes, as everything inside of it, but it's still swappable. So there are uh, some components that you can replace with whatever you want, which make it flexible. But at the same time, giving everything is uh, is or is is inside of it. Uh, you have this um, trust in it that it's not going to break during uh, each release. 
So the architecture of Kubernetes is the following one. So you have two types of uh, machines inside of the Kubernetes cluster. You have the master and you have the minions. The minions is where the containers are going to actually be running. The master instead is where all the decisions are made. As you can see, there is also there are both yellow circles at CD. So at CD is a distributed key value storage. Uh, which is used to hold all the data about, uh, about Kubernetes stuff, okay? So the master is going to store and read data inside of it. Uh, the master basically has three daemons running. There is the API server, which is your entry point into the cluster. This is how you interact with it. Uh, but it's also being used by all the other pieces to, to, uh, to coordinate themselves, to get information, to react to, to changes and such. You have the scheduler who is the one in charge to figure out, for example, where a certain container is going to be placed. You have a controller manager, that is the component that constantly looks at uh, the current state, figures out if it's different from your desired state, and then computes the actions that needs to be done, like I want a new container to be running, and then the scheduler will say, okay, this container has to be placed on this machine. And, and then, on the minion, you have the kubelet process, which will uh, be aware about, uh, hey, I have to run a container on, on, on my machine. So it, it will take care of running this container. To do that, the kubelet will interact with uh, some container engine. In this case, you can see there is Docker, but you can replace Docker with other container engines, like Rocket, for example, which is uh, an alternative container engine from CoreOS. And using this container engine, uh, the kubelet will create the pods. So the pod is, is a concept of Kubernetes which is unique to it. Uh, basically, you can decide that uh, different containers that have a strong relationship, a strong bond, that can be placed inside of the pod. A pod will remove some of the isolation features that are typical of containers. So for example, a peculiar thing, uh, all the containers inside of the pod they share the same network namespace, meaning they will have the same uh, uh, network card, they will have the same IP address. If uh, a typical use case for that, for example, let's say that you have a web application like a Ruby application, so you have, uh, you have I don't know, Puma as a web service for it, but you don't want to expose Puma to, to, the, to the internet traffic. What you usually do, it's really typical, you put something in front of it, like Nginx or Apache, I don't know. So um, you can have a container running your web application with Puma, and then you can have another container inside of the same pod, which is the official Nginx container. And then you have the Nginx container, which is going to um, be a, a balancer for the Puma, which is going to be listening on, on localhost, because from a networking point of view, everything inside of the pod is on the same network interface. So you can easily scale up the pod without having to duplicate uh, too much stuff. Uh, the last process of the minion is the kube proxy. This is required, as we will see later, to handle networking, which is a really complicated uh, topic. Uh, it's worth uh, a, dedicated, a dedicated talk, but if you, I will try to address that later on, but uh, if you have more questions in the end, you feel free to ask. So. Let's, do, let's look at a concrete example. So I will focus on using Kubernetes. So I will focus as being a user who wants to run stuff inside of Kubernetes. I want to uh, just to skip uh, the part about uh, bringing up Kubernetes and administering it. I want to focus on, on a user. A user who wants to run a simple application. So we have a web application uh, which is using a database to store its data. So we could have a web container running on host one and uh, a database container running on host number two. So what we want is uh, to be to react to failures. So if the host goes down, then of course it means the database container will go down as well. We want Kubernetes to react to this event by bringing up a new database instance somewhere else, like on host three. So this is implemented in Kubernetes using a, a replication controller, or there is also a replication set. Basically, they allow you to describe uh, the state. Say, I want to have five to one replicas running 
at the same time. So if this number changes in the current state, Kubernetes will take care of, of bringing everything back to what you specified. So let's take a quick look. I, would, I will go back and forth. So right now here, can you, can you read it? Is it big enough? Okay, so I have a Kubernetes cluster running on my machine. Uh, it's uh, composed by three nodes. Just ignore the, these ones. Uh, everything is running on, uh, on Leap so far. Uh, so we have three million nodes, and we are already running our uh, web application and the database. So here you can see that uh, I'm using kubectl, which is a command line tool to interact with Kubernetes. I'm getting the list of all the pods which are running. This is in real time. I can, as you can see, I have um, one of them running on minion zero, one of them running on minion two. So now if I SSH into minion uh, zero, If I do a Docker PS, I can see that, well, can you still see that because it's at the bottom of the screen? I hope so. Um, so it's running my container here. This is the guest book application. This is the ID of the container. So if I kill the container manually, as you can see, Kubernetes immediately noticed that uh, the guest book pod was uh, broken. It was not working properly. And it immediately fixed that. So my, my application is still up and running. I could, do, I could bring down the node, and of course that would trigger the move of the, of the container somewhere else, but uh, let's delete the pod instead. Uh, as you can see here, this one over one means that I want to have always one pod providing this guest book application running. So if I delete it, as you can see, this is a violation of my desired state. So a new pod is created, this time on a different node, on minion one. So as you can see, it's pretty robust. It's working. You might think we're done with that. That's not true. So uh, let me introduce you to the survey discovery problem. So let's define two actors. You have a producer which is a container which has a service running inside of it, like the database in our case, and you have a consumer, which is someone that is using this, uh, this service. So in our case, it's uh, the web application. So uh, when you start the web application container, you have to find where the database is running. Now, according to what kind of network setup you have, you might need to, uh, to know two kinds of information, like the IP address, of the database and maybe even the port number. With Kubernetes, you don't need the port, but with our solution, you do. So how do you figure out where something is running? You might be tempted to use the DNS, uh, like you usually do with normal stuff, but this is not going to work uh, because there are the DNS implementation on the client side, some of them are buggy and uh, they, they keep a cache, they don't respect the time to expire stuff, so things are not going to work well in the containerized world because you have to imagine that stuff keeps moving from one place to another, the IP address keeps changing and such. So um, the only way to do that is to use distributed key value storage like console, etcd, or zookeeper, and then register the information about the producer inside of it, and then make this information available to all the containers that are interested in that. Usually, this happens by setting some environment variables and then reading those environment variables back. So, there are still some changes, of course. Uh, even if you get everything to work when you start the web container, how are you going to, to handle a, a sudden move of a producer? So, like it happened before, the, if I, if I had killed uh, the, the Mongo database, that would have moved to another place and it would have another IP address. But the guest book application would be still looking for the Mongo database to the old IP address. So how can you react to these sudden changes? And uh, how do you face multiple choices? You might have different uh, backend services that you are consuming that are providing the same service. How can you choose between all of them? So 
the solution is to use a load balancer. You could be uh, placing a load balancer in front of all the producers and then point the consumer to the load balancer. This is going to work. However, this is not so easy as it might seem. So first of all, you have to make the load balancer aware of all these containers. So to read the configuration changes from this K value storage and then generate a new uh, configuration, reload the configuration. This is uh, going to add, depending on the load balancer, that can have some troubles when things keep changing and you keep reloading the configuration. So uh, that load balancer can, can be unresponsive. So uh, this is not really a good solution. And still, this is going to be the single point of failure of the whole thing because you have just one load balancer. Of course, you could place more of them, but uh, what is the solution? Uh, with Kubernetes, we have this concept of service. Outside of Kubernetes, you are on your own. You have to figure out how to do stuff. Kubernetes has this concept of uh, service. So with a service, uh, you basically, well, you point the consumer to the service and the service is going to put uh, the consumer in touch with the producer. So basically the whole service is like a switchboard operator and uh, it's going to take care of, uh, of making all the information flow to the right place. The nice thing is that it can also be used when you have to expose a service to, to the outside, like to the internet. So you can have two types of services. You can have the internal ones, which are not visible outside of the cluster, like the database service, but you can also have services which are exposed to, to the public. So you can point all the internet traffic, and this is going to flow straight to the right uh, web container, regardless of where this is running. How is this done? So Kubernetes does that by defining a virtual IP address for each service. This IP address is created once and it will always stay the same. It won't change at all. That means that, for example, using an add-on of Kubernetes, you can have an internal DNS, which is not going to break. It's not affected by all these issues uh, that I mentioned before. So you can have a DNS entry like, uh, I don't know, mongo.kubernetes that is going to be resolved to this virtual IP address. And then there is an internal load balancer which is running basically on each node, which is kube proxy, which uses IP tables to route the connection uh, to, the right, uh, to the right pod providing the service. This is for the internal services. For the published ones, they are like the internal services, so it's done in the same way. But then, uh, each node, each minion inside of your cluster is going to have these service exposed on a fixed port. So now you just have to take your load balancers and uh, point them to all the nodes of your cluster and to the same port on each one of them in order to expose this service. If you're running Kubernetes on some public cloud like AWS, there are even backends which are already implemented. So you can reuse all the load balancers that are already provided by uh, by AWS, in order so you don't have to maintain even even part of the infrastructure. So let me show you how this is going to work. So here we have our guest book. So we can write messages in there. These are stored inside of uh, MongoDB. So as you can see, I have the Mongo database running on minion number two, the guest book running on minion number one. So now, I'm going to force the move of the Mongo database to another node. So now the database is running on minion number zero. If I go there and I reload, as you can see, it's working. So the application is still reading data from the database, but uh, as you may notice, something happened, like we lost all the messages, which brings us to the next problem. Which is data persistency. So yeah, you can create 12 factors applications and respect all, all the manifesto and store data outside of it, but sometimes you still have to deal with stateful containers. So uh, we have to make sure that the data is persistent if the container is moved to another host or if it's uh, restarted or whatsoever, the data is not lost. So with 
other solutions, uh, like other orchestration engines, you are on your own. As I said in the beginning, there are, I don't know, 10 projects, 10 open source projects that try to address this problem. You try to find the one which works and you integrate that. But with Kubernetes, you have this concept of volumes. The nice thing is really nice, it's uh, being it built into Kubernetes, it just works out of the box, but it's also part of the grand design of Kubernetes, meaning that uh, uh, a volume is like any other type of resource, so it's uh, taken into consideration by the scheduler when deciding where something has to be run or if something can even be run. There is the concept of, uh, well, there is the administrator, the operator of Kubernetes is going to add some volumes to the cluster. Each volume is exposed as a persistent volume. And then, as a user, you just have to write a claim, a persistent volume uh, claim, meaning that uh, you need your application to have, I don't know, two gigabytes of space, and you want this space to be yours only. You don't want to have our application interacting with that, because, for example, you might be fine having our application interacting with this volume. And then the, the scheduler will look at uh, the persistent volumes that are available and will try to find a, a, a free one that can satisfy your claim. And then if it finds that, then it's fine. Your pod will be started. Otherwise, it will stay here until this condition is met. This is really nice. Uh, there are also different drivers available for you. So NFS, Ceph, Cinder, Gluster FS, whatever. Uh, you can decide how to backup all, uh, what to use in the back end of these volumes. It's really nice. So let's try to, to see how it works. So in the beginning, uh, right now as you see, there is no data persistency. Uh, here I'm, I defined already a, a volume which is called Mongo Storage. It has uh, two gigabytes of, uh, of space and it's available, as you can see. Uh, behind the scene, this is uh, implemented using NFS because it was pretty cheap to, for me to have everything running. So now, I have to, to change the definition uh, I have for the Mongo volume, uh, for the Mongo pod. So, basically I have to define, well this is, I didn't want to focus too much on that, but uh, this is how you define stuff uh, in Kubernetes. You have these YAML files that you can use to define all your types of resources, and then you can consume them. The point is, um, here, I'm going to say that I want to mount a volume under data DB, okay? And uh, here I define the volume claim. Uh, the volume claim as as some requirements, so I need the storage to offer me at least one gigabyte of space, and I'm fine with sharing this, this storage with someone else, so read, write, me if this is a policy. I have to apply those changes to my pod. By applying those changes, I had to recreate uh, the pod, so as you can see, the old one has been terminated, a new one is running. So the persistent volumes change it. The Mongo storage is no longer available. Now it's bound. And it's bound to this claim. Which you can see here, persistent volume claim. It's called Mongo NFS. It's bound to the Mongo storage. And everything is fine. So now, let's go there. If I reload, everything is empty, of course, because I restarted everything. Now let's create a message. Let's go back here. And let's delete again the pod running MongoDB. So it has been destroyed. Now it's running on uh, minion number zero. Let's reload the page. We have to wait for MongoDB to to be warm enough. So yeah, as you can see, the data is still around. So this is how you can uh, add data persistency in a really, really easy way. So even legacy application can keep working inside of uh, Kubernetes with uh, not many changes. One last thing, it's about uh, Docker Swarm. So I have been talking all the time about Kubernetes, 
but uh, there is also Docker Swarm out there. Uh, what about it? Well, things are a bit uh, complicated. Uh, before Docker 1.12, which is in RC1 right now, I think, Swarm was a separate project. Uh, it was something that you can could use on top of Docker. Uh, it has it had nice concept. Uh, basically, it uh, it was exposing the same API of the Docker engine, uh, but it had uh, a couple of extra uh, endpoints. By reusing the same API, it was possible to point any kind of tool written for the Docker engine against it and just use it. And that was uh, pretty smart. It, it was possible to do some nice things. Uh, it was really, really easy to use Worm. Uh, it was really easy to transition from using Docker on one machine to use Worm. However, it was a really, really simple orchestrator. It didn't have a concept of desired state. It didn't have a concept of service. Uh, it didn't have a lot of things. Uh, the scheduling algorithms uh, weren't so good. So that's one of the reasons why we, we just didn't decide to go for it. However, with 1.12, or since last Monday, um, they created, uh, they basically merged Swarm into the Docker engine itself. So now the Swarm project does no longer exist. There is the Swarm Kit uh, project, which is a generic framework that you can reuse to build orchestrators. This framework has been incorporated into the Docker engine. So um, now you don't have to add any extra tool. Everything comes out of the box. And they made a lot of changes compared to Swarm. It's a huge step forward. They took inspiration from different orchestration engines like Kubernetes. They copied some concepts from it, which is great because now, uh, while it's still really, really easy to deploy, uh, you get a lot of things that were missing in the past, like um, the desired state thing, the service discovery, they have an integrated load balancer using IPVS, which is uh, something built into the kernel, which works really, really well. Uh, so it's really cool. However, there are still some things that are left to the user. So there, if you want to have data persistency, then you have to figure out how to do that. There are different plugins, like I said in the, in the beginning. Uh, if you want to handle secrets, you are on your own. Uh, well, for Credentials, you could use environment variables, but for certificates and other things, you have to come up with something on your own. Uh, there are some operations that now are harder than before, like getting the logs from a running container on Kubernetes, for example. If I had to debug something, I could do uh, something like that. Sorry. I could do a get logs. Ah, by the way, um, right now I'm running kubectl on my, comp I'm on my, my laptop, and it's just pointed to a remote server, which is really nice. So I can get the logs. Whoa. So these are the logs in real time, if I want, of the pod. Let's say that uh, I have an application which has some trouble and I have to debug that live on production. Uh, so I can spawn a shell inside of, I can hook into the container basically. So by doing kubectl exec, uh, I can get a terminal running inside of uh, inside of the container. Uh, as you can see, I'm really inside of that container because bit number one is the Puma process. So this is really, really nice to debug stuff. And that was possible with Worm as well. You could have done a Docker exec, a Docker logs, and it would have worked. Now that uh, we move to this new model, this is no longer possible. You have to figure out where the container that you want to debug is running in terms of the host. Then you have to SSH into that host and then use the Docker engine which is running inside of it. So it's um, not so comfortable. Uh, another thing, another drawback is, well, of course it's tied to, to the Docker engine. While with other orchestration engines like Kubernetes or Nomad or I think even Mesos, you can you can decide what kind of orchestration engine, uh, sorry, container engine you want to use. 
Uh, of course, it's uh, it's uh, in an early stage. They just announced that, so it, it will get better and better over the time. Uh, but um, I think it targets a different use case. With Kubernetes, you can do fancy stuff like uh, isolate different tenants inside of the same cluster from a point of, from a networking point of view, if you want, or uh, have resource control over them, like set quotas to each one of them. You can have a tire integration with other stuff, like, um, for example, if you run that on top of OpenStack, you could uh, do auto, out, auto scaling based on uh, even on the on the um, cloud itself, based on the on the load inside of the cluster. You can do quite some stuff. It's a it's a different use case, I think. So with that, I think. I'm done with early advance. I kind of rushed during it because I introduced different slides compared to the last time I did the talk. So do you have any questions about that? Have you ever used orchestration engines before? OK. Containers? OK, good. <laughs> Okay, so if there's nothing, uh, I think we're done. Thanks. Okay, then.